Okay, it's about five minutes after the hour, so I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, just to make sure all of you are aware, um, all participants on the call are muted um, at the moment, so we won't be able to hear any background noise. The only two that you'll be able to hear or should be able to hear are myself, the chairperson, and Steve Gillen, um, our presenter. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Steve, and he is going to speak to us a bit, and then we will allow plenty of time for your questions and uh, his answers at the end. And after the call, for those of you that need, we will have continuing professional development hour certificates available for the time that you spent with us today, and I'll be sure that those get to you by the end of the week. And we will also have a recording of our webinar today available on our ConnectingTheGovDots.com website that we have, and I will include that in the email that is sent for, to a follow-up for all participants. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Steve Gillen, who is the Deputy Program Manager of Materials at the Illinois Tollway, and he is going to share with us some of his experience today with his use of warm mix processes um, along with SMA mixes. So I'm going to give the floor over to you, Steve, and you can take it away. Okay, Amy. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity here to present. Appreciate it. What I'm going to do here first is uh, get started with just the outline of the presentation, what I pre plan to uh, present to you all this, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're at. But uh, first of all, I'm going to just give you a brief background on the Illinois Tollway system itself, then I'll get into giving some historical background on how we got into warm mix processes, how we developed the uh, specifications for them, and which uh, led to mandated applications in year 2012. And then I'll summarize our applications since 2012, our lessons learned, and then go into a little bit of a detail on our most recent research project, which was the evaluation of all our SMAs using both HMA and WMA mixes. So let me get started here by the summarizing the tollway program. Jump to slide there. Let me go back. For those of you not familiar with the tollway, it uh, was created as a bypass around Chicago connecting Wisconsin and Indiana with the first segment of the system opened back in 1958 now includes five interstates of 292 centerline miles and spans across 12 counties in northeastern Illinois. There you see the map on the uh, screen there. <clears throat> it's grown over the years, changed as well. In 1959, the tollway had an average of 188,000 daily transactions. Today, nearly 60 years later, we serve 1.6 million drivers daily on our system, so it's grown significantly over the years and it's still growing. It's a user fee system, which means we take no state or federal tax dollars to uh, maintain or operate our system. So let me go to the next slide. When I say the tollway is continuing to grow, what this map shows is a current program, outlines the uh, current capital program the tollway is in the middle of, both for the purpose of rebuilding and expanding the existing system as well as adding on to the existing system. A good many of the uh, system, I'd say probably somewhere in the area 75% or a little less of the system is being totally rebuilt right now. This is a middle of a, approximately a $20 billion, 20, 25 year capital program. We're halfway through it, I'd say at this time. So it's a, a lot of work currently being done at the tollway to rebuild it and expand it both at the same time. Now let me get into the uh, warm mix itself, how we got started using it. Our first trial, that was in year 2008 when uh, the EvoTherm people helped us greatly on getting the first trial placed off of I-90. This was uh, on a ramp, Irene Road ramp we called it where we tried it with a binder lift placement. That was on a, the mix was initially produced with the chemical additive, the EvoTherm additive, but placed as a hot mix SMA for the first third of the project. And the production temperature was then reduced to around 300 degrees for the next uh, third of the project, and then ultimately down to around 250 degrees for the final third of the ramp placement. And this uh, photo here shows you the bottom third of that placement where the 
Evotherm mix, SMA mix, was placed as a true warm mix at a reduced temperature. We just wanted to compare the uh, placement and workability operations and compactability of that mix at the various temperatures when it was first uh, produced and placed. Now this project, uh, once we finished it, both the constructability benefits we saw of it as well as the condition we saw several years after placement convinced us to pursue the potential of warm mix usage. More and more of it is what we wanted to uh, look into starting in 2008. Plant modifications didn't take much is what we learned as well through this project. These are pictures, actual pictures I believe that uh, were taken in 2008 showing the temporary plant modifications that were needed to be provided by Evotherm when this project was uh, set up back in 2008. Didn't take much effort at all and that proved to us as well that it was feasible to bring warm mix into the picture. Something else we needed to uh, do was evaluate warm mix concept even further for its application in metropolitan areas. As you saw in the previous system map of the tollway, it's a commuter metropolitan commuter system for the most part where construction or rehab projects are not uh, supposed to get in the way of or slow down our commuters that use the tollway. That's our objective is we got to stay out of the way of the uh, daily drivers, so to say, is our our primary goal. So we had to make sure that using warm mix asphalt processes on nighttime overlay projects that we opened to heavy traffic the following morning did not result in deformation issues. So that's what uh, initiated this project, this particular research project. It was used as a research demonstration project where all of the typical warm mix asphalt processes, that being chemical, organic, and water injection foam were applied to various portions of our system and evaluated. Okay, this uh, the evotherm was the chemical process used in this study that was performed under the direction of Dr. Ahmad al Qaidi of the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Gyratory compactors, they were set up at the production plants to quickly produce the test specimens and then flown down to the U of I lab for performance evaluations to start at just a three hour age. So this was quite a fast track project, interesting project to, uh, to perform. As you can see, there's a guy getting on an airplane there. We actually had to fly, do a quick one hour flight down to the laboratory with all the uh, specimens. Probably had uh, some hot muff or uh, oven muffins on there, I bet, probably on his hands, as warm as everything was. And, so the uh, actual testing itself, that the evaluation that we did on these mixes included uh, rutting potential that was evaluated, evaluated with the use of the Omberg wheel tracker test and the flow number test procedures. Mixed strengths were evaluated through the complex modulus test. Surface strength through in situ lightweight falling weight deflectometer or FWD test. Indirect tensile test that was used to measure the mixes resistance to creep and cracking. And then the semicircular bend or SCB test that was used to measure crack resistance at intermediate temperatures. So a lot of uh, interesting work went into this or testing went into this to prove to us that we weren't going to have any issues with early age traffic being put on these pavements, these warm mix pavements. This is a diagram that shows kind of the timing of all the tests that were done on these uh, specimens. You see they vary here from three hours to to as much as 12 weeks in age. So it's uh, quite, a, quite a variation in time span there, but uh, a good evaluation was done as a result of all this work. Now here's a picture showing the uh, lightweight deflectometer. Every 30 minutes it was taken for the first three hours after compaction of the uh, WMA-SMA mixes, and then every three hours thereafter until the overlays reached a total age of about 24 hours what the criteria was on that. So our conclusions from this study, which was very extensive, was that asphalt mixtures, mixtures, SMAs in particular, with various warm mix additives showed comparable early age performance when you compared it to the control SMA that was uh, produced and placed as a hot mix asphalt. The only exception being workability 
was what we found uh, present in this study, that being that organic methods, organic processes tended to interfere with the workability or made the mixes a little more sticky or hard to work with is what was uh, proven from the contractor standpoint in particular. That's why we haven't really used organic uh, processes since this was all tested with. Most everything since this study or since we have mandated or mix asphalt has been the chemical and water processes that have been used on all our mixes. Also another conclusion was due to lower compaction temperatures. The warm mix asphalt mixes may be open to traffic earlier than HMA, providing the same modulus. In other words, it improved the timing. If anything, it made this uh, resistance deformation even better with the use of WMAs. And also, of course, WMA is a more friendly, environmental friendly, I should say, uh, process in HMA, while at the same time being cost competitive with our HMAs. We have not seen a major cost impact since we started mandating the WMA process. And I think that's one of the important uh, items as well that we wanted to prove. So in 2011, that's when we started getting going on our uh, development of specifications. We realized it was time to convert most all asphalt mixes to warm mix production for the purposes of uh, improving both the environmental and economic pillars of sustainability. It's one of the primary goals at the tollway is to rebuild our system in the greenest and cleanest way possible. One of the reasons why we got the program approved through the uh, state politicians. Now, the environmental pillar of sustainability, that's easily improved with the reduced energy needs to produce the mixes, of course, and of course with blue, reduced uh, blue smoke production. Now, the economic leg, we find that to be improved with the WMA mixes being more easily compacted for a longer life expectancy with little, if any, impact on the upfront construction costs. So specifications for mix design and construction using the warm mix asphalt processes were developed in 2011 for application to all of our 2012 projects. So let me start getting into the 2012 year. That's when we started going full blast on uh, WMA production. The contractors on towway projects that year paved over three quarter of a million tons of warm mix. About 300,000 tons of that was SMA and over 200,000 tons each of shoulder binder and shoulder surface mix were placed in 2012. The tollway specification does allow contractors to request a waiver from the use of war mix for small tonnage placements. Now, the items like patching did not require the use of war mix, so there was some hot mix placed in 2012, but very, very small amount. It was far less than 5% of the total tonnage on all our uh, reconstruction and construction and rehab projects that year. Summarizing the uh, plant production, 10 different plants produced uh, warm mix in 2012. We pre-warned the industry that it was coming because we knew that plant modifications were going to be important. And uh, the tollway specifications for the use of a uh, given warm mix technology, it requires a provider of that uh, technology to confirm that their system was used on at least three other projects within the USA and provide test data verifying that their system does not change the performance grade of the asphalt binder. For the 10 plants in 2012, seven producers chose to use chemical technologies while three producers chose to use the water injection method. In addition to uh, project examples of past use, war mix providers must also submit the dosage requirements for the mixes to be used on the job, as well as recommended mixing and compaction temperature ranges for their particular system. Now we get into the lessons learned uh, down the road here, but the one item I think that we learned that affected war mix production in particular, the uh, temperatures used with high recycled content in the mixes kind of taught us a lesson there. So the higher the amount of recycled mixes or materials, I should say, in our mixes taught us that your temperatures weren't going to be that easily reduced, so to say. The higher levels of uh, 
ABR, asphalt binder replacement as we call it, it uh, has impact on your production temperatures without a doubt. So it's a case where that's something to always keep in mind. The tollway shoots high as you can see by the percentages on this screen. We don't hold back on going high on our asphalt binder replacements with the use of uh, fractionated wrap and recycled roof shingles being given the option to all our contractors to some degree. So therefore these high ABR, the higher the percentages they are, the higher your warm mix temperatures had to be during production. Typically with low levels of ABR in the mixer you can easily get to a 250 degree production temperature. If you get up to 60 percent, 50 percent in those ranges you're going to have to up the temperature a little bit. Probably closer to 270 to 275 in that area. So that's something to always keep in mind. Now the tollway placement of uh, warm mix asphalt since 2012, you can see the numbers here on this screen, it hasn't been little, anywhere from 436,000 tons to 783,000 tons over the past four years have been uh, placed on our system, both as SMAs, stabilized sub-bases under new concrete pavements, and uh, asphalt shoulders. Most all of our shoulders on the system are asphalt. Now let me get uh, a little bit more into the lessons learned part of it here. Get my page turned here. There we go. Now across the board, mixes that contain shingles required higher production temperatures, as I said earlier. And uh, that, that required the temperatures to go up closer to 275 to 300 degrees, as I previously said. Depending upon the producer, an outside observer might have found it a challenge to see how the use of warm mix technology did anything with the temperatures for the SMA. Aside from one producer that was consistently able to make their RAS containing SMAs at 280 degrees using a foam, foaming system, most SMA production was at or right around 300 degrees Fahrenheit with our uh, high EBR levels, typically in the area of 35%. Now, however, given that the SMAs with shingles are typically produced with as a hot mix around 340 to 350 degrees, the use of warm mix did reduce production temperatures consistently at around 40 to 50 degrees. So one item that needed to be overcome with the wholesale introduction of warm mix was the apprehension of some plant personnel to try something new. That's, that's always the case with our construction industries change is not easy to implement or to make them do. These pro professionals are very protective of their equipment, their mixes, and their reputations, as you all probably know, and especially if a producer had not used a warm mix technology, there was some anxiety surrounding the modification of procedures that they have seen accustomed to for so long. But once we got the uh, changes made in 2012, the moans and groans disappeared quickly, believe me. Everybody is pretty well adapted to it here in the Chicago area, and all of the contractors are set up to produce nothing but WMA for tollway projects in particular. Now, some additional lessons learned. Overall, I think everyone involved would agree that the tollway's implementation of uh, WMA since 2012 has been successful. It was certainly not without its challenges, and some producers had a steeper learning curve than others did. But across the board, all of the warm mix technologies performed effectively performance-wise. At a minimum, the warm mix helped the contractors achieve more consistent density, and sometimes with less effort. At a maximum, some producers used the technology as designed to maintain lower production temperatures and reduce fuel cost and to make a more comfortable environment for the paving crews. So I think that's uh, the primary positives you know, in behind this. And as I said earlier, one item that uh, you always have to keep in mind for the producers is to fully implement the use of warm mix, especially with high amounts of recycled materials. Plant operations need to be given a complete review. Always keep that in mind to determine, you know, if the plant is fully optimized to handle 
the use of high volume recycled coupled with lower temperatures. Make sure your plants are equipped to do that is what's going to be important with everyone. So that's where we stand today. Let me move on to us uh, our next slide here. Now with the rapid implementation of the Tollways large uh, programs, capital programs, as I said earlier, green initiatives were important to consider in order to prevent shortages of the natural resources needed to rebuild our roadways to this extent this fast. So here on this slide, I show some of the green initiatives related to asphalt that we have applied since year 2007, since these capital programs started. Number one there on the list eliminated the need for fibers and SMAs, that with the use of uh, ground tire rubber as a modifier. Uh, introduced fractionated wrap in all our mixes, allowed for higher asphalt binder replacement in all frap mixes compared to wrap mixes. Typically, the, uh, using FRAP, you can get 10 to 15% more recycled asphalt pavement into a mix if you fractionate. Increased uh, ABR binder levels with the use of shingles. That was a big uh, positive that occurred back in 2009 and 10 when that got rolling. And as a result of all these higher ABR levels in our mixes, we had to specify softer binders for the higher ABR levels. And then, of course, uh, the other last big green initiative there is the implementation or mandating of warm mix processes for all our asphalt mixes. <clears throat> Without a doubt, has improved performance at little or no extra cost. Now, the big question what we had to resolve or yet to answer after all of this got uh, implemented was did the green initiatives maintain or reduce the good performance of SMA surface mixes? I think you see, as I commented on the previous slide there, I had just mentioned that uh, you know it improved performance at little or no extra cost, but it took something to prove that to us. We needed that question answered to us back in 2015, and that's when we got this research project rolling. We needed an evaluation done on our pavements to uh, prove to us that the performance was not hindered with the use of all these green initiatives. So what we did back in 2015, we got SMA pavements cored at seven locations. With, all had various levels of ABR, asphalt binder replacement levels, the warm mix asphalt. And these were both warm mix and HMA cores or specimens, overlays and pavements that were uh, sampled. Five of them were warm mix, or I'm sorry, five of them were HMA and two of them were uh, warm mix asphalt samples. They were tested with Hamburg to measure rutting resistance and then tested with the uh, direct uh, tension test to measure thermal and block cracking resistance. The DCT tester was used on this. This was all through Dr. Bill Butler when he was at the University of Illinois. He's now transferred to Missouri, but uh, Dr. Butler led the study on this project here back in 2015. This uh, diagram here on this slide, this shows you the locations, the approximate locations of where the SMA surface course mixes were sampled. They were all placed between 2008 and 2012, sampled in 2015 and evaluated in year 2015 and last year, 2016. So that gave a good range of age to anywhere from uh, four to eight years in age typically is what we were seeing on these evaluations. This slide here shows you the little bit more detail on these seven mixes that were evaluated or seven placements, showing you the uh, AC grade levels as well as the uh, thicknesses, the ABR levels, the coarse aggregate type, and the year of placement that was shown. They, they were all at different ages, up to eight years of service, as I said, ABR levels up to 37%. Projects with and without roof shingles, recycled asphalt shingles as part of the ABR component, different aggregate types, different binders, PGA high and low temperature grades varied 70 and 76 on the high side and uh, minus 22 to minus 28 on the low side. As well as different asphalt modifiers were used in these mixes as well. Some were SBS, others with GTR, ground tire rubber in them. 
And what the basic purpose of this test was to compare the uh, performance of these mixes in a bracket, so to say, a two-dimensional view of performance by sim simultaneously viewing the Homburg and the DCT results on a chart. And that's what you see here on this screen here. This is kind of showing the, the, the uh, layout for a typical two-dimensional chart to compare rutting resistance to cracking resistance, cold weather cracking resistance in particular. And what you want is typically you want to be in that upper pink area, upper right-hand corner, get into that portion of the uh, chart as much as you possibly can to show a mix with high performance for high traffic roadways, which is what the tollway basically has got on the entire system. A lot of busy expressways, as I indicated by our data showing 1.6 million daily users a day on the system. Takes a lot of traffic. So we definitely want to be in that upper right-hand corner with our test results. And what the results of this uh, study showed is that for most of the mixes that were sampled, we were in that pink uh, rectangular area in the upper right-hand corner, as you can see. And the warm mix asphalts samples that were uh, produced, and they, those were produced using EvoTherm, by the way, are shown right in the middle of all of the, uh, the plots there. So the results look good. The plot suggests that we might be able to use an even softer version AC grade with these mixes to push the performance even further into the desired pink box. And we conclude this since the Homburg results have a considerable factor of safety. So we might uh, consider trading off some of the rut resistance for some additional fracture resistance is what we uh, might be doing here. Or if we wish to keep the Homburg results where they are, we could also consider investigating in a slightly higher performance virgin binder grade, which holds the line on high temperature grade, but which softens the lower temperature grade. In other words, a binder with a bigger PG spread, or some others call it a wider usable temperature range, is what could be considered. Of course, we'd need to evaluate this potential strategy from a combination of performance and life cycle cost analysis uh, viewpoints. Now this will be the subject of future research that we perform down the road. But for now I think you can see the benefits of having these uh, two performance tests compared side by side in a two-dimensional two chart like this. It all uh, proved out that our materials that have been placed over the course of the last eight years were not showing a decrease in performance compared to control mixes or pavements uh, done in the past with 0% ABR. Very little difference between them is what we're seeing here. So in conclusion, or in summary, I should say, initial trials in 2008 proved that SMAs with a chemical process could be produced and paved at high temperatures for cold weather placement and at the reduced temperatures for all other production. Research in 2010 that proved that opening WMAs, SMAs in particular, to early age, within hours I should say when I say early age, heavy traffic, that was no issue. In research in 2015 that proved that using the uh, warm mix processes with SMA high performance mixes at moderately high ABR levels, it didn't impact the long term performance of those mixes. That basically gives you an overall summarization of our uh, implementation of SMAs with warm mix processing. It's all been a proven success to us, and we will continue to uh, utilize it for the future. And there's a lot left to be done, believe me, on our system. So at this so point, uh, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. And yeah, questions. Steve, thanks so much for your, your presentation. Um, we have quite a few on the call, and um, we had – Quite a few questions submitted um, prior to um, the call today, so I have those ready to discuss, but also wanted to let those of you know who are on the call, if you would like to send in a question for us to answer right now, you'll see a chat section in the lower left-hand side of your screen, and you can feel free to write your questions there, and we will see those and um, get to all of them. So if we want to go ahead and you guys can send those in as you'd like, and we'll go ahead and start, Steve, with some of the questions that were sent in to us previously. Um, so it said on, um, you mentioned temperature limits and cold weather placements. So does the tollway have minimum or maximum temperatures for warm mix? 
Yes, we do, with, without a doubt. I mean, besides the manufacturer has to have, have limits. You know, the system manufacturer has to have their limits set relative to production temperature. That's what's followed. But in terms of weather conditions or ambient temperatures, with warm mix uh, processes, the temperature limits go down, without a doubt, on SMA mixes in particular. Current specifications at the toy requires a dry surface with the uh, roadbed temperature to be at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or higher at the time of placement. And the ambient temperature has to be 50 degrees and rising as well at the time of placement. However, with a warm mix SMA, you can place it on a, a roadbed that is above 40 degrees. That temperature can go down at 40, de to 40 degrees rather than 50 degrees and the ambient air temperature can be as cool as 32 degrees and rising. That's one of the benefits of uh, using the WMA processes is you can, as the temperatures get colder, the, temp the uh, production temperatures can be increased and placement can be accomplished with uh, little interference with the density or compaction efforts that the contractor needs to take. Um, okay, our next one says, with warm mix being mandated in 2012, what is next for the tollway? You know, what is next for the tollway? More of the same. It's, I, I kind of told you that mm -hmm. the future, I guess, is to look into modifying the uh, PG grade spread, so to say, on our mixes to see if we can get our ABR levels even higher than where they're at now, which is about as high as anyone in the country has gone. But can we do better? It, make the mixes greener is, is kind of what our objective is for the future. But... Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing, too, is the fact that uh, the future direction for the tollway, too, is going to be to switch from method specifications or prescriptive specs for mixed designs to performance-based mixed design specifications. That's a uh, research study we're getting off ground right now. But, uh, we hope to have, get rolling by the end of this year so that in another two or three years, there really won't be so much limitation on how a, a contractor produces his mixes as long as it can meet the performance criteria. That's all that really matters, and that's kind of what we're shooting for for the future here. Um, okay, we have a question coming in uh, now as well that asks, do you have the same summary of recommendations for your non-SMA asphalt placement and performance? In terms of shoulder mixes and uh, stabilized sub-base mixes. The recommendations can, aren't going to be the same, I'll be honest with you, because the ABR levels in those mixes are going to be significantly higher. In our stabilized sub-bases, the uh, ABR levels go as high as over 60% in uh, stabilized sub-base pavements that go under a concrete pavement. So we really haven't had to summarize, so to say, the recommendations on those mixes, those because they're all low volume uh, mixes, not exposed to the environment nearly as much as our high performance SMA mixes are. Those are the ones that we really have to keep a close eye on. Um, okay, then as a follow up, uh, they're asking if you still recommend the use of warm mix asphalt. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's mandated. I mean, it's it has to be used. The only place it can't be used is on small volume placements where. Uh, permissive use of, war of hot mix is given by the tollway. Otherwise, warm mix is all the only choice. And that's okay. how it will stay at the tollway because uh, the performance we've gotten out of these systems and the less, lesser compaction or density issues that we've seen, our longitudinal joint lifes are no issue. Things are imp have definitely improved since we converted to uh, warm mix. Okay. Um, what are the surface and or air temperature requirements for SMA paving? Okay, well that's kind of what I just uh, summarized in that first question. For, the, uh, for a warm mix asphalt, the surface temperature of the roadbed has to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit and the amateur temperature in the shade has to be 32 degrees and rising. Okay. Now what temperature, production temperatures are needed at those temperatures is when the ambient uh, or weather conditions are in in those uh, cold conditions, that's more or less for the contractor to decide what he needs to heat it at. That's when we give permission to the contractor to heat it to 350 degrees if that's what it takes 
to uh, get the to get the placement accomplished in the cold weather environments. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, approximately the longest haul you've experienced? Oh boy, that that's a hard one for me to pull off the top of my head. I'll be honest. Uh, some of our projects out in the boondocks, out in the uh, far western edges of the Chicago area, west of the Fox River. It uh, probably, I would estimate some of those probably went as long as far as 30 or 40 miles to get to the end of placement. Some of those roadway overlays were as long as 35 miles in length. Typically they put the uh, plants in the middle of the jobs because they were all high volume placement jobs. So that's what I would estimate to be the longest, somewhat, somewhat in that area. Okay. Um, what kind of compaction data comparing various projects do you keep? We keep all data. Uh, we have a very, very sophisticated uh, web-based database or uh, materials management system database where all density data is kept or maintained on every project. And we could easily queue the data, do statistical analysis on it, at the you know push of a button with our uh, what we call the IMIRS database system that we use to keep record of all our uh, field data, quality control, quality assurance data. Okay. So with, it's available, but I'll be honest, we have not had to really do queues or you know queries into the uh, the data because we haven't had compaction issues or any problems getting obtaining density. Um, okay, the next question that we have is asking, what's the maximum total ABR you'd feel comfortable utilizing in an SMA? Current specifications allow us to go no higher than 40%. And in the past, typically I think they were, most of our mixes were just a little under that. If I could go back to the uh, slides, which I can't go backwards now, but the, one, the chart that I showed showed uh, ABR percentages, if I remember, to as high as 37% when we evaluated uh, all of the mixes, if I remember correctly. Let me see. I can find it for us if you want to refer to it. It was at, uh, here it is. I got it here in a piece of paper. Yeah, the highest uh, ABR was 37% in specimen E. That was a that was a warm mix, and that was one of our warm mix specimens. Another one was 31 percent, 33 percent, and since then, consistently, all the uh, surface lifts have been around 35 percent, with no issue or, or problem at all. Some as high as almost 40, and that's what our spec limit is at the moment. They can't go higher than a 40 percent ABR in our mixes now. Okay. Um, it looks like the last question that we had previously submitted um, says asks about the performance comparison when using a PG7028 SBS to a PG7622 GTR. Okay, that's a hard one to answer as well because we don't classify our GTR uh, mixes based on the uh, PG raid box because of the uh, several of the tests that you can't perform that you're inhibited from performing with the ground tire rubber due to the uh, particle, the crumb rubber particles that are in the uh, the liquid. We have to specify it based on the base binder grade plus a percentage of ground tire rubber. So for instance, a 7028 SBS would be comparable to a 5828 GTR with 10 to 12 percent rubber content is how we uh, would equate it. So really a 7622 GTR that would have been used, that would have been equivalent to a 64-22 base liquid using about 10 to 12 percent rubber. And that would only have applied to low ABR percentages, less than 20 percent. Whereas the 7028 SBS that's used with higher ABR and, you know, just like our, that would be equivalent to a 5828 GTR is what we would uh, equate that to 
and we've seen that the higher SBS mixes or the mixes with higher levels of uh, ABR in the SBS mixes are no different in performance than what we have seen in the past. That previous chart, like I was uh, referring to on slide 24, I think that would kind of give you a good comparison of what I'm trying to mention right here. If you look at the uh, AC grades there, you can see how the uh, 7028 SBSs they all equate to high EBR mixes, whereas a GTR, you're, you don't see on this particular chart any 7628 GTRs because all of the ones on this particular screen show ABRs less than 20%. So in this particular study, we did not do a GTR, high ABR comparison, but uh, where we have used them, we've seen no problems on the uh, system. The overlays are still in good shape. Great. Um, it looks like that is all the questions that we have. If you have any more questions and you're on the line and you want to chat those in now, um, we have a little bit of time and we can um, answer those. And if there is nothing else, um, thanks so much, Steve, for your time. Um, like I said at the beginning of the call, we will be sure to have this recording um, on our YouTube channel and on our Connecting the Dots website. Um, also, for those of you who have joined and need the professional development uh, hours as credit, I will be providing certificates for those. And if you have any questions, you can follow up with me at amy.chaconis at longevity.com. And we really appreciate your time, Steve, and all of those who have joined us today. So thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Have a great afternoon. Okay, you too. Bye-bye.